Dark Cast Network. Welcome to the dark side of podcasts. Just sit right there and you'll hear a tale, a tale of dark cast shows that started with a tight knit team. But look how much we've grown as 2022 progressed. Sadly, some shows were lost, yet new ones joined up with the team. And now our network's boss. Hell yeah, our network's boss. Our shows cover the spooky things like cryptid schools and ghosts. The demons of your nightmares are best friends with our hosts. I bet they know our shows. The tone is dark and creepy. Some talk about disease, conspiracy, and murderers. Mass hysteria and some cults. So much true crime and so much more here on Dark Cast Network. Hello, everyone. My name is Gregory Zink, and I'd like to welcome you to my political true crime podcast called Smoke-Filled Rooms. With my background in political science, I present deep-dive storytelling shows that focus on history's most infamous governments, leaders, parties, policies, and discontents. For at the core of society's dysfunctions are the criminal powers that lord over us, and the attempts by competing interests to strike back at the system. So grab a couple cigars and meet me behind the Capitol building for bi-weekly episodes featuring the political realm's most diabolical. The Smoke-Filled Rooms podcast is a member of the Dark Cast Network and is available wherever you get your podcasts. And make sure to visit smokefilledrooms.net to sign up for my mailing list. Listener discretion is advised for topics including violence, coarse language, substance use, sex, and disturbing situations. We'll see you soon. Hey there! I'm your best friend and your worst influence. Remember that. Hey there, Rainbow Warriors! Welcome to Beyond the Rainbow, True Crimes of the LGBTQ+. I'm your host, CJ. Join me on the socials just about everywhere as Rainbow Crimes for Darkcast Network. A big shout out to my patrons. Without you and your support, I'd be lost. If you'd like to become a Patreon member and get a show shout out, a unicorn named for you at the Seabreeze Studios stables, ad free episodes, early release of those episodes, and one extra episode a month not shared yet here on the regular show, please think about becoming a patron. I'll leave a link to my Patreon account in the show notes. Let's see, not much to update you all on in my life. Except my neighbor fixed my master bedroom toilet. It was leaking. And my dishwasher door wouldn't shut. And he fixed that too. Yay! Other than that, not a lot going on. Except for my sick cat that I'm fighting to keep alive by making her kitty smoothies. That's dry cat food because it's higher in calories, wet kitty food, and chicken broth. For the first couple of weeks, she was really good about letting me bottle feed her. But now it's a struggle. And my dog Nilla, she's been kind of hit or miss about eating her food. Honestly, it's been emotionally draining for the past couple of months. Okay, I guess I did have a couple of things to share. But now, let's get into our case. At the end of the 1930s, beginning of 1940s, Patricia Burton was in line to become an heiress of the Burton beer fortune. Patricia, who went by Patsy, was pretty much born with that proverbial spoon in her mouth. At the age of 19, she was a socialite and a major party girl in New York City. She definitely was used to getting what she wanted. Her father was William O. Burton, the owner of the Burton Beer Fortune. He was worth about $10 million. So that means if $1 million in 1940 money is worth $20 million today, his fortune would be worth about $200 million in today's money. That's a lot of lettuce. Hold that thought. We'll get back to Patsy and her dad soon. Wayne Lonergan was born in Canada. He had two siblings, a brother and a sister. 
They lost their mom when they were young, as she passed away in a mental facility. Their dad passed away when Wayne was just barely out of his teen years. As a young adult during the Great Depression, Wayne never seemed to have a hard time finding a job. He was a lifeguard, and he served in Ontario's premier anti-labor squad. And I'm fairly certain this was due to Wayne's natural good looks and his charm. In 1939, he moved to New York City just in time for the World's Fair, in which he got a job. His job as a guide was to push wealthy, tired, and worn-out sightseers around the fair. The guides were chosen for their looks, and with Wayne being six foot three, around 185 pounds, and having a handsome face and a well-toned body, he fit the bill. Wayne found himself one day pushing around a well-dressed, wealthy man in his fifties. The gentleman being pushed by Wayne was William O. Burton. That's right, Patsy's dad. William had taken a strong liking to Wayne, and he invited him back to his apartment when Wayne was off work. Now, Wayne was very likely bisexual, because he seemed to enjoy both men and women. The World's Fair held a vast selection of both genders for Wayne to cruise and pick up a tasty selection. And now, here he was being invited back to this wealthy man's apartment. What to do? However, Wayne was considered by some a gold digger, a fortune hunter, an opportunist. And maybe he was. But Wayne decided he would take William up on his offer. William's apartment was in the Beekman Hill, Ritchie Rich area of New York City. This apartment was one of several homes William owned. He had a couple of apartments and a house where his wife and daughter lived, but William enjoyed an occasional tryst with a handsome young man. Wayne, however, became a regular dessert for William, and he became a part of William's family. Wayne moved into the family's main house and accompanied William on many of his business trips. This allowed Wayne to see the world. About a year later, William knew he was dying. He encouraged Wayne to marry his daughter. And after William's death, Wayne and Patsy eloped in Las Vegas. It most definitely was not a match made in heaven. Wayne became arm candy for socialite Patsy. He would attend formal and casual functions with her. A trophy husband, I believe that's what it's called although she treated him more like he worked for her, and she belittled him often. But Wayne tried to remain good-natured with it. After all, she was now worth millions. The couple had a child together, a son. They named him William Anthony. Having a child didn't slow Wayne and Patsy down, but after two years of constant partying, frequenting nightclubs until the wee hours in the morning, Heavy drinking and living it up, Patsy started to bore of Wayne. She told her mother their marriage was a mistake. The couple would fight. He felt emasculated, not having more control over their money, and she wasn't about to let him have more control. Sure, he was good-looking. Sure, he handled himself well in public. Sure, he was the father of her child. But she was tired of him. She felt he had ulterior motives, like money, and being a bit spoiled, Patsy, as I said, always got what she wanted. This time, she demanded Wayne leave. In June of 1943, Wayne returned to Canada, the Toronto area. He left their now one-year-old son with Patsy. After Wayne moved out, Patsy moved out. She left her mom's house and moved into a three-floor apartment with her son and their full-time nanny. By August, the couple was officially separated, and Wayne's income was reduced to small handouts, if Patsy felt generous enough to give him anything. For the first time in his life, Wayne's job options were very bleak. He floated from one menial job to another just to make ends meet. He truly missed the life he was living when William was alive. Not sure what else to do, Wayne joined the Canadian Air Force. On Saturday, October 23, 1943, Wayne went to New York on leave from the Air Force. He stayed with a friend in the city. 
That same night, Patsy was out on the town with a date, doing her normal partying, nightclubbing thing while the baby boy was at home with the live-in nanny. Wayne arranged to see his son while Patsy was out partying with the nanny present. He went to the door, but no one answered, and he left a stuffed toy elephant for his son. No one saw Wayne at Patsy's door ever. Patsy arrived home the next morning around 6.30 a.m. She got undressed and climbed into bed. The nanny watched the baby all day, and it was pretty uneventful. No sounds other than the baby. No noise. Just a regular day. She figured Patsy was out all night and needed her sleep. She saw no one come into the house or leave the house. But apparently someone did. Patsy's friend Peter came over to see Patsy later that day. The nanny let him in and told Peter Patsy was still in her room sleeping. Peter went up to Patsy's room and knocked. He tried the door, but it was locked. He yelled for her, but there was no sound. He continued to yell for her, but nothing. Finally, Peter broke down the door to Patsy's bedroom. Inside, 22-year-old Patsy lay naked on her bed. She'd been bludgeoned and strangled to death. There was bruising on her neck and three deep wounds to her head caused by a heavy candle holder. Nothing had been taken, so it was determined robbery was not the motive. Wayne flew back to Toronto the same night of Patsy's death. Within 24 hours, he was in a Canadian police station being questioned. After hours of being in the small room, Wayne confessed to killing Patsy back in New York. He said it was in self-defense after she inflicted great physical pain on him. But at his trial, Wayne claimed not guilty. He at first said he was on a date with a woman. He then stated he was on a date with a male soldier. He was very hesitant to admit he had gay sexual encounters because, well, the 1940s, hello. The 1930s were called the Gay Thirties, but that's not the kind of gay we know today. And in 1940, homosexuality was deemed as deviant and a sickness. <coughs> I feel gay today. I think I'm coming down with a case of gay. Ridiculous, but even more ridiculous are the countries and people in general who still believe it's a sickness. The prosecution went after Wayne Hard, claiming that he was after Patsy's fortune. When he was being questioned in the police department, he had some scratches on his face. During the trial, Wayne claimed that the scratches were from the soldier he was with. He said in the morning he woke up to the soldier leaving with his cash and his Royal Canadian Air Force uniform. But the jury sided with the prosecution, and they found Wayne guilty of murdering his estranged wife. Wayne was sentenced to life in prison. While he was incarcerated in Sing Sing Prison, Wayne tried to go after some of Patsy's fortune. Not a good look for your cause, Wayne. But the state denied him since he was serving life in prison. This meant he was considered civilly dead and not allowed to go after anything. In 1954, William Anthony, Patsy and Wayne's son, he would inherit the Burton family fortune. In 1965, Wayne attempted to appeal his sentence, claiming that the Canadian police beat the confession out of him during questioning. He was not granted an appeal. Wayne was released on parole in 1967. The terms were that he had to return to and remain in Canada. Wayne Lonergan died at the age of 67 on New Year's Day in 1986 from cancer in his home country of Canada. Well now, what do you guys think? Did Wayne kill his soon-to-be ex-wife? Or could it have been someone else? I did a serial killer check for 1943, and it seems that there were six active serial killers. But over half of them were in other countries, and none of them were in New York. Could it have been Patsy's date? Maybe she didn't want to put out for him. Sure, I suppose so, but there was no mention if he was even questioned. Could it have been a random killing? Unlikely, but sure. Normally, with those kind of random killings, they break into your home, 
and you interrupt him as they're trying to steal stuff from you. Could it have been Wayne? Absolutely. But if it wasn't, an innocent young man was incarcerated for many years for a crime he didn't commit. I'm going to wish Wayne to rest in power anyway, because there are little seeds of doubt in my mind whether he actually was the one that murdered his wife. So, rest in power, Wayne. Our true crime quickie this episode comes to us from Missouri, or misery as my grandma Dorothy would call it, because she was from there. On November 20th, 2003, Beverly Gunther was outside her work when her ex-boyfriend, Scott McLaughlin, abducted her in the parking lot. He took her, raped her, and stabbed her to death. Scott then drove her body to an area in South St. Louis near the banks of the Mississippi River, and that's where he left her body. Scott would stalk Beverly. He'd hide in her building. He'd often go and harass her at her work. These are the acts that inspired Beverly to file for a restraining order against Scott. That, unfortunately, didn't help. When Beverly never showed up to her home the night of November 20th, her neighbors, who were well aware of Beverly's situation with Scott, noticed she never came home and they alerted police. Police, too, were aware of Beverly's issues with Scott because they were called out several times to escort her to her vehicle when he was outside. I just can't imagine having to live in constant fear that way. But Beverly was. A broken knife handle was found outside of Beverly's workplace. And being they only had one suspect in mind, police brought Scott in for questioning. Scott finally confessed to killing Beverly, and he led the police to her body. At trial, a jury found Scott guilty of the first-degree murder of Beverly and the judge in the case gave Scott the death penalty. You may have heard of this case as recently as January 3rd, 2023. That's right, just a few days ago when the guilty party was executed. Scott McLaughlin is the dead name for Amber McLaughlin. Amber filed for clemency and a judge overturned her death sentence in 2016 but a federal appeals court reinstated Amber's death sentence. Okay, so I want to explain a little about Amber's childhood, and it might get a little confusing as I flip-flop names and pronouns, so try to hold on. When Amber was a little boy, she was in and out of foster care, and her treatment as a child was abusive, to say the least. One foster mother rubbed human shit in her face when she was just a toddler. Dr. C.J. believes being in the foster system to begin with would lead any child to abandonment issues. And I feel very sad for Amber Scott, the child. Ideally, all children should be in a warm and loving home. But that's just not reality. Just as not all foster homes and families are horrible, not all foster children turn into murderers. So, once Amber became an adult, All empathy and sympathy I might have had for her went out the door when she began stalking Beverly. Amber started her transitioning in prison. This was around 2019-2020. It wasn't until 2018 when another trans prisoner named Jessica Hicklin fought the Missouri prison system over receiving hormone injections, and she won. The policy she changed stated that no prisoner not already underway with the transitioning process before incarceration, would receive hormone treatment when in prison. Once Jessica won her case, she became a mentor to other incarcerated trans women in her prison, including Amber. And here's a tidbit. It's estimated that nearly 5,000 trans people are incarcerated in state prisons. Amber's last words before her lethal injection took place were, I'm sorry for what I did. I'm a loving and caring person. And then she spoke to a spiritual advisor. And then the deed was done. Rest in power, Beverly. Fuck off, Amber. Love you, Rainbow Warriors. Remember, you matter. And it's not a crime to be gay, bi, trans, or to live your truth unless you're a murderer.